an available V6 or diesel. Pontiac 6000. Now the excitement really begins. For a brief, brilliant moment in history, Pontiac was a styling and performance leader in American cars, fueling testosterone dreams and led by a charismatic individual that dared to challenge GM's stodgy hierarchy, and they made legends. However, for most of their history, they were nothing more than another platform-sharing, value-priced GM division. And once corporate engines were used, the brand struggled with an identity and with sales. Sadly, the wide track division was having a minor renaissance when it was abruptly canceled. This is a far too brief history of Pontiac. So welcome back to All Cars, y'all. I am John, and first I wanna say thanks to my viewers who suggested Pontiac as our next far too brief topic. While I'd like to say that the story of Pontiac starts with another brilliant engineer fueled by passion, it's really not the case. The fact is that to start with Pontiac, you've gotta start with Oakland. Now, Oakland was founded in 1907 by Edward Murphy, who made horse-drawn carriages if, with his Pontiac Buggy Company. This story is eerily similar to the start of William C. Durant's story, who also made carriages and ended up founding General Motors as a holding company for his controlling interest in Buick. Durant later added Oldsmobile and Cadillac, and in 1909, he added Oakland as the value-priced brand in his lineup and they made cars such as the Oakland Four. Now, historically, Oakland and Pontiac wouldn't use another four-cylinder until 1961. Soon, Oakland was sharing platforms and engines with the other GM divisions. The Oakland name actually came from the county in which it was based, Oakland, Michigan, and Pontiac was the county seat and also had a factory to which production was moved to. GM acquired Chevrolet in 1917, but Chevy took its place as the value below Oakland. By the 1920s, GM product ladder started with that price-leading Chevy, moved upward in price, power, and luxury through Oakland, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac. However, by the mid-20s, gaps had developed in this strategy, which GM saw they could fill with sub-brands. Legendary GM president Alfred P. Sloan introduced what was called the companion makes to supplement the existing lineups. Now these weren't all new brands being launched, but brand names introduced within existing divisions made it much cheaper to build while also boosting sales. Much like we see today with say the Prius with Toyota or the Bronco family with Ford, individual but not separate. Pontiac was introduced at the 1926 New York Auto Show as the companion to Oakland. Associatedly, in 1927, Cadillac added LaSalle, designed by the legendary Harley Earl. Oldsmobile added the Viking, and Buick added the Marquette in 1929. It's worth noting that the name Pontiac has three different meanings. The first is to honor the coach building business of the founder. The second, the factory location. And third, the Native American chief of the same name. Here's where the brands and their companion makes were priced and slotted into GM's product plan. So of the base brands, you had Cadillac, Buick, Oakland, Oldsmobile, and Chevrolet. Cadillac had LaSalle. Beneath Buick was slotted Viking from Oldsmobile. Beneath Oakland was slotted the Marquette from Buick. And beneath Oldsmobile was Pontiac by Oakland. Unfortunately, the Great Depression was unkind to these brands, and the Marquette was canceled at the end of 1930. The Viking brand was canceled at the end of 1931. LaSalle actually ended up lasting until 1940, ultimately being squeezed out between Buick and Cadillac. However, our hero of the story, Pontiac, had a completely different ending. The 26 Pontiacs had a short wheelbase, light six, priced to sell at four-cylinder price points but still above Chevy's. Pontiac sold more than 75,000 units its first year with over 140,000 in 1927 and more than 200,000 in 1928. By 1931, the depression claimed Oakland, leaving Pontiac 
as the survivor in its place. That Pontiac was the 6-27 and had a 3.1 liter with 40 horsepower. In 1932, Pontiac introduced the Series 302 V8 of 4.1 liters and 85 horsepower. Oddly, they switched to a straight eight in just 1933, making them the least expensive cars with a straight eight at a time the economy was improving. We're gonna talk about the straight eight a little bit later. Costs were controlled by using much of the Chevy Master, such as the body but installing a large chrome strip at the top and the center of the hood that Pontiac called the Silver Streak. Only these eight cylinders were offered in 33 and 34, making 3.7 liters and 77 horsepower. In 1937, all Pontiac models except for a new station wagon began using the B body along with Olds, LaSalle, and Buicks. The six cylinder became a 3.6 liter with 85 horsepower and the eight became a 4.1 with 100 horsepower. The last pre-war Pontiac was February 2nd, 1942. It's important at this point to note that for much of its history so far and through the 50s, Pontiacs were considered solid but not especially powerful or exciting. The straight eight was cheaper to produce but heavier and longer and restricted it to a low red line and a lower compression ratio at a time where V8s were becoming more powerful. This quiet and competent approach suited the Pontiac brand at the time. After the war, Pontiacs were essentially 1942 models with automatic hydromatic transmission added in 1948. The first all new Pontiac came out in 1949, including a new model to be called the Chieftain. Again, built on the GMB body platform as the smaller and lowest price model, but oddly was matched in very similar dimensions, engine trim lines, and options by the Streamliner model. Chieftains came with four engine options, two sixes and two eights with slightly different horsepowers. Interestingly, the first generation had options such as a radio with seven vacuum tubes, a tissue dispenser, and a Remington Auto Home Shaver. In 1952, Pontiac discontinued the Streamliner and replaced it with models based on the GMA bodies. In 1954, they added the Star Chief, which was an A body but with an 11 inch stretch. All new bodies and chassis were introduced in 1955, including a new Strato Streak V8 with 173 horsepower and the six-cylinder models were being discontinued, a fact that held until 1977 when GM downsized their cars. In 1957, Bunky Knudsen became the general manager of Pontiac and began reworking the brand's image. Along with one of his engineering heads, a gentleman you may have heard of by the name of John DeLorean, he removed the silver streak from the 57 models right before they were set to be released and introduced the Bonneville as a limited edition Star Chief convertible that showed off Pontiac's first fuel-injected engine. Expensive, as you could buy a Cadillac for the same price, it effectively raised interest in Pontiac. 1959 was a historic year for Pontiac. Prior to 1959, Pontiac had used an Indian motif in their logo, and in 1959 came out with its arrowhead emblem with a star in the middle. There were major, major body styling changes across all of the models that increased the amount of glass, twin tail fins, and lower hood profiles. Nunson noticed that the bodies looked awkward sitting on the 1958 frame, so he ordered that the track be widened by about five inches, ushering in the wide track. Pontiacs that looked good, and they handled better too. The lineup was simplified with the Bonneville being the top of the line, and all cars came out with a 6.4 liter V8 with horsepower ranging from 215 to 345. Motor Trend picked the entire Pontiac lineup as their car of the year for 1959. The 1960 models were once again reskinned, removing the tail fins and split grill, and in 1961 reworked again, adding the split grill back in with an all new bodies and all new chassis for the full size models. Based on earlier success of the Corvair, GM gave Pontiac and John DeLorean the lead in developing a new car. The result was the addition of the Tempest, a compact along with the Buick Special and the Oldsmobile F85 and Cutlass. These were unibody cars based on what was called the Y-body platform. 
Together, they offered more innovation than any other American products of the decade. Specifically, the Tempest was offered with a 195 cubic inch four-cylinder with horsepower ranging from about 110 to 166, the only U.S. car built with such an engine. The transmission was at the rear, allowing the use of four-wheel independent suspension, a flat floor inside, improved interior space, and a nearly 50-50 weight distribution. It was Motor Trend's 1961 Car of the Year and deserves, honestly, its own video. And it was offered in what was called a Le Mans trim upgrade. By 1962, the popularity of the Tempest helped Pontiac move to third place, a position it would hold until 1970. In 1961, Knudsen moved to Chevy and Pete Estes took over as the general manager of Pontiac and DeLorean was promoted to chief engineer and they continued to make Pontiac a performance brand. In 1962, they introduced the Grand Prix, a coupe with bucket seats. In 1964, the Tempest moved to a more conventional A-body platform shared with the Skylark, the Cutlass, the El Camino, the Le Mans, and others. DeLorean came up with the idea of the GTO, putting a 6.4 liter V8 engine into a Le Mans and in coupe, hard cop, top, and convertible bodies. Engines were rated at either 325 horsepower or 348. This is the great one, the ultimate driving machine. Original sales were forecast to be 5,000 units, but the package sold over 32,000 its first year. In 1965, DeLorean was promoted to the head of the division and coincidentally the entire Pontiac lineup once again got Motor Trend's Car of the Year award. Again. And in 1966, the GTO became its own separate model. Almost yearly styling changes were being made at this time and we won't try to cover each one of them, but two important models were coming up. In 1967, Pontiac introduced the Firebird based on the Chevy Camaro and was their answer to the Ford Mustang. And in 1969, they introduced the new Grand Prix. Sales of the coupe were slow before this, and Pontiac couldn't afford to develop its own replacement. His former boss, Estes, had moved to Chevy, so DeLorean contacted him, and they agreed to share the cost, and with Pontiac having a one-year exclusive right to the new car. The next year, Chevy would introduce the Monte Carlo. The new Grand Prix was a major success, selling over 112,000 units in 1969, more than four times the number of the 1968 model. The same year, DeLorean moved to the general manager spot at Chevy. Of an interesting note is that in the 1960s, GM directed General Motors Research and Development and Pontiac to develop concepts for mini cars for urban drivers. GM developed a gas-electric hybrid called the XP833. Pontiac designed a mid-engined, aircraft-type, air-cooled, two-stroke radial engine called the X4. And needless to say, neither one of them reached production. 1971 was the start of the decline of Pontiac. GM issued a corporate edict that all engines be capable of using unleaded gasoline, dropping compression ratios, lowering performance, and lowering fuel economy. The ever more powerful and larger engines of the 60s were gone. Now Pontiac was trying to build cars to compete with the more luxurious Buicks and Oldsmobiles. They introduced the Ventura II in 1971, the GTO became a sub-series of the Le Mans again in 1972, and the Tempest was just dropped outright. In 1973, they restyled the Grand Prix, Le Mans, and Ventura and introduced the Grand Am as part of the Le Mans lineup. New emissions and safety standards meant power dropped again. By 1975, two of the three variations of the 455 CI engine were gone and the last one only lasted through 1976. In 1975, they added a subcompact variant of the Vega and in 76, the Sunbird, also based on the Vega. For 1977, the full-size cars began their downsizing along with the rest of GM's B-bodies, and the increasingly similar styling began to cheapen the brand's image. Also in 77, the 2.5-liter Iron Duke four-cylinder engine was introduced, at first replacing the Vega's troublesome aluminum block engine, and would go on to be used well into the early 90s. The Firebird achieved its Smokey and the Bandit fame at this time, as well as being on the Rockford Files TV show. 
Through the 70s and 80s, luxury, safety, and economy were the main selling points for the former excitement brand, with more station wagons being offered, padded vinyl roofs on almost every model, and wire wheel covers made a return since the first time since the 30s. The 1980s opened with a front wheel drive bang being the form of the Phoenix, a version of that terribly troublesome Citation. In 82, the Firebird got a major redesign and Knight Rider helped make it a near classic. Of note was the 1984 Fiero, a mid-engine two-seat coupe. This is another Pontiac that probably deserves its own video at some point because it started as a lie to GM management about what they were trying to design. It ended up being somewhat troublesome with a low rent interior, but became kind of famous and was partially responsible for Pontiac having its first sales increase in four years. The 6000 was introduced based on the Celebrity and the 84 Special Touring Exist Edition, STE, was added to it to make it a competitor for the Mercedes 190. Full-size buyers wanted a full-size Pontiac, so the division imported the Canadian Pontiac Parsonine, which really was just a trim of a Chevy Caprice. It sold well, but once again just really damaged Pontiac's image. By 1988, Pontiac was once again the number three domestic, and the median age had dropped from 46 and 81 to 38. But the cumulative effects of platform sharing and badge engineering were really just beginning. In 1990, Pontiac got its first minivan, the Transport. The Grand Prix got its first ever four-door model. And in 92, a new Bonneville and in 93, an all-new Firebird. The Sunbird was replaced with the Sunfire and the new Grand Prix in 97 with a wider is better advertising campaign, harkening back to those old wide-body Pontiacs of the 60s. Of course, many revisions, styling updates, and engine options all changed. Unfortunately, most of them are extremely boring. As the 2000s starts, it's interesting to look back because in 1989, Pontiac sold over 800,000 units. But by 97, that was down to about 616,000. And that number is actually up from the mid 500s that it was selling in the middle of the 90s. And that 616,000 is also the high point as Pontiac entered a long and not quite so slow decline. Most of the 90 sales were in that mid 500,000 range, but there was an effort to add youth and excitement to the division again. In 2000, the Bonneville got a major redesign. It was based on the G-Body platform shared with the Olds Aurora and the Buick LeSabre. In 2001, the Aztec was dumped into the world and in many ways encapsulates everything that was wrong with Pontiac and General Motors. There was some really smart thinking in this vehicle that was in a pretty neat package but became absolutely wrecked with corporate platform sharing, engineering, cost cutting, management interference, and of course exterior design. What should have been a home run for the division ended up becoming a joke to many. In 2003, Pontiac got a Toyota-based compact wagon called the Vibe, and while it's a good car, it's not exactly excitement. Once again showing some life, in 2004 Pontiac saw the GTO return, a rebadged version of an Australian-developed Holden Monaro. Enthusiasts had been asking for this car after seeing articles in like Car and Driver that said it was the best GM vehicle at its time. And with the support of Bob Lutz, he eventually made it happen. Unfortunately, GM management really fought against it. The culture resisted and it was very slow to bring it here. So by the time it got here in 2004, that 2001 design already looked a little dated. And the original price had ballooned from 25,000 to almost 34,000. With an LS1 engine good for 350 horsepower and then an LS2 with 400 independent suspension, it could perform, but sales didn't follow. It underachieved selling only about 40,000 vehicles in the three years it was offered. More life came when the 2006 Solstice was introduced. It had a 2.4 liter inline four cylinder making 177 horsepower and was a hit for the company, although in a low volume. Between 06 and 2010, they sold just over 65,000 of them. Again, low volume, but ended up dwarfing the sales of that GTO. Oldsmobile was canceled in 2004 and Pontiac revamped their lineup. 
and the Grand Am became the G6, which personally I think looks really good. It was really just another corporate platform and corporate engine. The Bonneville was canceled after nearly 50 years. The Aztec was phased out quietly and replaced with the Torrent, a Chevy Equinox clone. In 2005, the Sunfire was discontinued and replaced by the G5, but oddly only as a coupe. The G8 was introduced in 2008 and was another Holden-built import. Interestingly, it was considered a poor man's BMW M5 for its similar performance in a much cheaper package, and the G8 GXP was the most powerful production Pontiac car ever built and is considered one of the best driver's cars to ever wear a Pontiac badge. It had a 6.2 liter V8 making 415 horsepower. This was at the end, but what a way to go out. In December of 2008, GM announced it was considering eliminating various brands while asking Congress for a $25 billion loan. In February of 29, GM proposed the sale or elimination of Saturn and Hummer and the sale of Saab. Pontiac was teased as remaining, focusing on niche models aimed at a youthful or sporty segment, but there were no real details provided with that. And in April, they released a study that the company would eliminate Pontiac while keeping GMC, Chevy, Cadillac, and Buick. The division would end up winding down by 2010. I didn't know that in 2009, Jim Waldron of Michigan, he was a Pontiac dealer, announced that he was interested in purchasing the Pontiac brand and had lined up financing for the purchase of the brand and some plants from GM to actually build the cars. GM flat out refused and told him Pontiac was not for sale. GM still owns the trademark for Pontiac and there's always a little bit of talk among enthusiasts that it's going to return, but fittingly, the last Pontiac in 2010 was a white four-door G6 sedan, a rental car ending for the excitement division. In conclusion, I grew up in a GM family. My parents liked Buicks and Oldsmobiles. My grandfather on one side owned Cadillacs. My grandfather on the other side owned Pontiacs. Most of my memories growing up of Pontiacs were the Grand Ams and the Bonnevilles and the Sunfires of the 80s and the 90s, all competent cars and sometimes a little spirited, but not exactly exciting or extremely well built or with high quality materials. The legend of cars such as the Goat and the Firebird live on in my mind and those of others, but they were replaced with marketing speak about performance and odd interiors. I've mentioned many times how much I really hate their smooth gray buttons and knobs that they used. I've seen comments that Pontiac was canceled right as it was having a resurgent led by Holden cars, and I can see that point of view. While the flawed Aztec showed that individual thinking was alive at Pontiac, the Solstice and the GTO and the G8 were good attempts, and it could be argued they were the future of a brand leading heavily into performance again. But I think that's only half the story. That same corporate mindset still existed in strangled Pontiac, with the G6 being just a rental car boring special and the G5 being offered only as a coupe, and only after the dealers begged for something to sell in that size. The resurgence was too little, too late, and for a division was by that point just too watered down. In writing this and putting this video together, I found that I don't respect or even miss Pontiac. Sure, for a brief moment they'd made beautiful and powerful cars, but for the other 70-ish years of their history, they were just another GM brand, sharing platforms and engines and differentiating by options. Once the movement at GM to make corporate engines and take any unique individuality away from the division happened, it was a long, slow death for the brand. Never as price conscious as a Chevy, never as luxurious as a Buick, and never able to take the boring platforms from GM and make them into a performance platform. They were hampered on all sides, and with increasing competition from European and Japanese brands, it appears the death was inevitable. The fact of the matter is, you can take a Chevy and make it more sporty, 
and you can take a Buick and make it more sporty, what makes Pontiac different when they're all using the same platforms and engines? That was the curse of Pontiac. One's relationships with car brands tends to be very, very personal. And if you are a person who loves Pontiac and misses them, I understand, I do. But for me, Pontiac is just another boring brand from GM with a few highlights, maybe a few styling flares here and there. And while I know many people believe it should be brought back, I simply don't agree. It's time has passed, and unfortunately the memory of what was Pontiac is really a very, very, very narrow history of what ended up being decades of solid but unexciting. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks you all for being here. I appreciate it and hope you enjoyed this video on a brief history of Pontiac. I know there's a lot I didn't cover because I just simply couldn't go through every model and every engine variation. I wanted to hit the high points to illustrate the story of Pontiac and that really what we remember is a very, very brief period in their history. And I do want to thank my Patreon supporters. If you want to support independent auto news pinions, please consider supporting me and see your name up in lights down below. Thanks.